Hey, welcome to the Windsider Film Room. We are honored to welcome the 2019 Coach of the Year, Chicago Sky head coach, James Wade. James, welcome to the show. How's it going? Uh, thank you for having me. It's going pretty good. It's going pretty good. How's Wubble life? Uh, you're, I'm, I've lost count because I'm, I'm also lack of sleep for the past, what, two months? But, like, how's, how's it going in the Wubble with the team? It's, you know, it's pretty routine now. You know, you get up, you eat, you practice, you watch video, you practice, you get up, you go to sleep. You, so it's, it's pretty routine with everything that we've been doing. And everybody's gotten to, like, the normal routine where you're seeing the same people every day and you speak and, you, you know, you just put your head down and you keep going. So uh, the good thing about it is we have basketball. So it's, it's, it's okay. So talk to me. The Chicago Sky team, and we've talked, to, we've had a few of your team on the show, on this show and, and on our podcast, and everybody talks about how much like a family you guys are. And I'm curious, you're the leader of the family. What were these things that like you instilled, installed very early on, or was it something that kind of grew and blossomed over your time as head coach? Uh, no, I think it was, you know, when I, when I went through the process, when um, we talked about uh, the team and potential that the team had um you know I I, I talked to the, the ownership about culture and and so that was going to be really important as far as us um reaching our potential that we had to be able to play and fight for each other um even when it wasn't going bad I, I mean I I felt like our roster was capable um you know to do better than they had been doing uh, but I thought a lot of it was going to depend on the buy-in, uh, just not into their talent, but into the talent and, you know, everything of, of the team. And um, so that was important. That was something that we, uh, from day one, we said, this is how we want to operate. And uh, from that from that time, we said, if we operate like this, maybe you'll see uh, something that you hadn't seen uh, in the prior years. So I have to ask, and I'm sorry to put you on the hot seat, I, I did this to a couple of your players, so I'm curious. Is it hard not to play favorites? Because you coach some of your team overseas. Some of your team hangs out with your wife and your kid in France. Like, how do you not pick favorites? Uh, I think, you know, each individual is different. And you have to give them a, specifically what they need. And uh, so that's, you know, that's, that's good in figuring it out. Um, I, I, I give... Uh, you know, I give everybody something different, but I just try to give it to them all equally. Um, they're all they're all uh, different, like very different individuals. But like we say um, in Chicago, you might be different, but you're mine. So they know they're all mine, and that's that's all that counts. Coach, from your time in San Antonio, you won a championship in 2017. Um, you're, you're coach of the year in 2019 to now, you know, 2020 in the WNBA bubble, your time overseas. Talk to us about your journey, your coaching journey, um, and some, some of the most influential people you've learned from. Um, I, I guess um, when you talk about the game, my, the journey was like an accident. Like, um, I thought that um, I would probably be coaching high school or junior high or something by now. Um, and it, it all started with Dan Hughes just asking me to go to lunch and, um, and, you know, him, he, while I was playing, he, he just asked me, did I, you know, what did I think about going into coaching? I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to do it. And he was like, maybe I'll give you a call, you know, maybe, you know, I, I can help you with that. That's, that was his exact words. Those were his exact words. And a year and a half later, he gave me an internship and it just went from there. Um, and I, and, you know, I, I remember us being in Chicago and he, he, on a road trip and he said, I think you're going to be a, a wonderful head coach one day. And I, you know, <laughs> I, I went home and told my wife, I was like, this guy is really funny. You know, he says, he thinks I'm going to be a great head coach. <laughs> I'm like, I'm an intern. You know? <laughs> he was right. Man, that's, a, that's incredible. Yeah. So, so, you know, it was, uh, it, that was, that was pretty, that was pretty funny. And, uh, you know, after, he retired. I went on to coach with with Cheryl, and you know those are those are two like very influential people in my life. And you know, just watching them close up and seeing how they prepare and seeing the you know attention to detail and how how they affect the the players and you know the team and and how they respond, how the players respond to them has, has been something that I've picked up. And what Cheryl always you know told me to do, she's like, hey, look. 
uh, I, you know, you, you have something and you just have to be yourself. So whatever I take from them, you know, I put in my bag, but at the end of the day, I have to be myself. And that's, that's the most important thing. So if you're, if you're talking about two of the most influential people, like close up, it's, it's, it's probably those two. Can you please clarify for me what your role is overseas on U- UMMC. I mean, like, because I've heard different people report it different ways. You're the head coach for the Americans. You're an assistant coach. Like, how do you define your role overseas? Oh, so, I, so Miguel Mendez, he's the head coach, and uh, he's a great head coach, and I, he's he's been influential to me as well. Um, you know, um, he's 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 been you know, especially the way uh, I see offense and things of that nature. Uh, I'm his assistant. And, uh, you know, he, he gives me, he gives me a, a lot of responsibility, which is really good, but uh, we follow his lead. He's a great guy. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, he's, he's, been, he's been a pleasure to work with these last few years. I'm curious, what in your mind is the biggest struggle? Because you also, we also have like Sandy Brandello, who's head coach of the Opals and is overseas a lot. Like, and obviously you guys have your own connection there with your coaching staff. But I'm curious for a head coach who's not based in, America for the whole year what do you think the biggest challenge is even though you kind of get the both the great end of both sticks because you got your players over there too yeah I think one of the biggest thing is is the scouting uh piece where you get to see players live like uh you I, I have opportunities where I can go you know because we have enough breaks uh but you know you see other coaches that are like scouting all year long um the one thing that probably helped us out is that our roster was pretty you know our roster was pretty full um, and, um, we knew what we wanted. Uh, so I, I think, you know, most of the players like with our team are overseas all the time. And so I get to spend a lot of time uh, with our players, whether it's Gabby or the two players that I'm coaching, Ali and Sloop or Diamond last year who spent Ga- Diamond and actually Diamond and Gabby spent New Year's with us in France, um, last, last uh, season. And, um, you know, I had Jameer with me as well. Um, and Astu, when she was with us, you know, we played against her four times. Like it, it, like for me, I think it benefits me a lot because I get to see uh, our players and I get to see potential free agents and what they do and ha- and how how they improve. Uh, like the downside of it, and that's why we have a coaching staff is. Uh, the rookies that are coming in, like the college rookies, it's always good to see them up close and personal, whether it's one game or two or however many. Um, but I don't get to see that as much, but that's what our assistants get to do, and I have to trust them with that. But, you know, it's, it's going to look different because this year the season overseas is going to be a little different, uh, and, and you know, college is going to be a little different. So I, I'll, I've, I'll get a chance to scout up close and personal, especially for our first rounder that we have. Coach, I could sit here and pick your mind on a million different things on domestic and international basketball, but yes, we are on film room, and I'm sorry, I wish we could talk more about a lot of that stuff, trust me. Um, Let's dive into the film. You guys run a ton of action, um, some of the best action, in my my opinion, in the league, and I know RA feels the same, Uh, but as we kind of get into this, would you mind sharing with us, like, I know this is a really open-ended question, but what is your basketball philosophy on both ends of the floor? Uh, I think uh, offensive, uh, defensively or offensively. <laughs> I'll, I'll start with whatever you want me to start with. Let's let's start with both. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, offensively, uh, we thrive on movement. Uh, we thrive on pace, uh, but pace can can be north and south and east and west. Um, I think a, a lot of teams they thrive on getting the ball up and down the floor, uh, but we want the ball to go uh, across the floor. Uh, we want to get paint touches as much as possible. And I think that's really important for the way we move the ball. We want we want quick decisions, uh, whether that's um, what we want quick decisions with the ball, whether that's movement off the ball or whether that's um, whether that's with the ball. We don't want the ball to stick. And any, so even though you have a, a great ball handler like Snoop, uh, she's not a person that dribbles the ball, uh, dribbles the heck out of the ball. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's important. That's our philosophy on offense, and we want to get good shots. We always like to sacrifice. You hear, uh, you hear that, uh, you know, sacrifice a good shot for a great shot. Uh, but one of the reasons that we talked about culture was because we knew we wanted to play like this, and we knew that, you know, in order for us players willing to sacrifice for each other, uh, they would have to want to play for each other. And so that was another reason for the culture change also. 
Um, defensively, we want to be as disruptive as possible and um, make sure that we we protect the paint and force you into bad shots. Uh, and uh, a lot of that depends on the personnel you have. But, you know, we've had our challenges. But uh, I think um, we've always been in an upward battle as far as where we are um, defensively. I think we've improved leaps and bounds since I've gotten the team and um, since we've gotten the team as a coaching staff. And I think we're only up going going to go up from here. Well, that was a perfect segue as we talk about defending the paint because we've got a few clips here of Stevens just doing her thing. We hope she's healing. We hope she's doing well. But, man, she has been a hell of an addition to the team and to the success you guys have had this year. Talk to us just kind of about her presence in the paint. Uh, her length. Uh, her length and her foot speed and the way she runs the floor is just amazing, I think. Um, and that's the one thing that we noticed uh, her in her rookie year uh, when, when, when we scouted her, um, how quick she was off the floor, how long she was. Um, a little bit undisciplined right now as a defense, defensive player uh, because I don't know if she's ever been asked to do that much. But um, we think that her potential is, you know, really amazing as far as the things that she can do uh, switching. Uh, like she's actually uh, allows us to play small ball without being small. And I that, mean, you look at all these rejections and how – she's like one of the first people up the court too. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Like she's – I think if um, if she was healthy all year, and I don't know how they do the voting, but I think she's uh, comeback player of the year. Now, we have some good news from her. Um, you know, what she has uh, as far as the injury is concerned, she'll be back fairly quickly. Uh, just not quick enough to play this season, but she'll be back 100% and there's no problem there. So – we think that she's a franchise cornerstone and, and, you know, we're just excited. We're excited to have her. I mean, you didn't, you didn't miss on that. I mean, that this has been so fun to see her play so far this year. And another one, we got to talk about Cheyenne Parker and her development through the league. Um, we're going to go through a few clips on Parker. I mean, just a dominant force inside and you can tell that you've really created um, a, an offense and just a really intentional uh, purpose to get her more touches inside. And we'll go through some of these clips. Feel free to just explain whatever's going on. I know this is a lot of action, and we probably don't have time to break it all down. But, you know, she plays great with her ability to stretch the floor, and she screens so much. She gets so many of your, your, your players open. Well, the, thing, the thing about Cheyenne, and the thing about Allie, if you can go back, if sure. you can go back there, like um, when we were healthy, we had six uh, or seven players shooting over 37% from three, and Cheyenne was one of them. And the thing about Allie and, and the reason we run her through a lot of action is because uh, she draws a lot of attention. And so when you draw some attention out from Cheyenne, that's what people didn't, uh, I, I guess they know it now, but uh, we came into the season uh, knowing that she was going to shoot a lot of threes. So when we run action like this right here and she draws attention, we, we expect for her and uh, the other, other post players we got to just step out and be able to down. And adding that to her game, for her, you know, her being able to play in the and and play at three, it just makes her a low to guard. So um, this is just a simple. Basically, she runs. She pretends to go off the screen, but she refuses it. Runs back, pulls the defender, and Cheyenne's wide open for a shot. Right, right. Wow, that's a matchup nightmare. It, it is, uh, and and just because she's so. You know, just because she has so much girth and she plays so hard, like um, she's someone that likes the physicality. So we, you know, people I've heard people call us a finesse team, but uh, you know, Cheyenne, so with the, Parker. <laughs> Cheyenne is one of the least finesse uh, players. Like the thing is, is that she does have she does have a skill set as far as footwork and this and that. She's a, she's going to be a mismatch for whoever uh, has to guard her because she's not slow. Um, and she's, she's also someone that likes the physicality of basketball and she has, you know, she has footwork and, and things of that nature. So, um, we, we love, uh, having her as an anchor. Um, uh, like she's, I, I think we got to a point where we, we, we had her coming off the bench because we wanted somebody to play to off the bench because we know that the ball is going to be a lot in Sloop's hands. Uh, but she's so good that, you know, she, we have, we have to start her. Like we have to start her cause she's you can't guard her really, you know? Well, and just this, this simple play here. I mean, we talk about positionless basketball, you know, nobody wants to be a true five anymore. And so just this simple, she, she reads her defender's face. She cuts across the face. She, she buries them under the basket. 
you guys get her the ball. I mean, this is, this is just textbook four out one in basketball, but she's one of the best in my opinion in the league at it right now. Um, and you can just tell like every time they're passing on the perimeter, they're inside looking for her. I mean, they're yeah. looking inside. Yeah. And so the, the good thing about it is that what I was fortunate enough to have is in, in 2017, 2018, I was fortunate enough to work with Sylvia. And, uh, you know, when, when Waylon wasn't on the floor or, you know, we can just run simple stuff where she'll just duck in, especially when the defense committed on one side of the floor. And um, that's something that we try to do with Cheyenne. When the defense is committed, just have her sit her down there and have her duck in because her timing is so good. And uh, she's, just, she's just really effective when it comes to that. And even if they push her out a little bit, um, she has the footwork to go around and uh, do things and play make for a team. You, you've seen her like add, add the shot from mid range and add uh, passing skills. I think we won a game. Um, I, I, it was against Washington. We won a game against Washington uh, where she was able to play make to diamond at the end of the game. Uh, so it was, it was really good. We might have that clip later. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now explain to our viewers this set. Um, a lot of, a lot of action you can run out of a horn set. You guys run a ton of it. Um, this one, I think is just a simple, you know, comes off really a non-screen and then just opposite post dive. But what is so effective about this set specifically for you guys? I, I mean, I think the thing is, is we keep the ball out, the, out, out, out in the middle of the floor, but we don't involve the, the screener and the horns uh, because a lot of times uh, teams will trap uh, Sloop to get the ball out of our hands and to, you know, to kind of get us to start prematurely our set. And so you'll see an overload and, and you set the screen with Quigley because you know she's going to take attention. Like she's going to bring attention with, with her. And uh, so it's going to leave Cheyenne um, at, at a four out one end set and with no backside help. So if they try to beat her to the top side, then we'll have a lob. And if they don't beat her to the top side, we'll have an isolated post where, where a post player is playing behind her. And uh, we feel like if she hit, gets that with nobody helping off the weak side, because the post player has to make sure that Quigley doesn't curl, um, then Cheyenne just goes into her move. It would not be a Chicago Sky feature if we didn't talk about one of the greatest point guards in the league, history and present, um, Courtney Vandersloot. Um, some more action. I mean, you end up throwing it inside. I think, it, I think this goes into Cheyenne, but uh, just simple high ball screen, cross screen in the post action, super effective. I mean, that's a tough pass. There's two defenders around her. <laughs> I mean, it's not a lot of people that, like, it's not a lot of people that can run that play, uh, you know, that can make that pass. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's a great screening, and it's great screening. And I, I know that, you know, the one, the good thing about Sloot is Sloot probably isn't watching Cheyenne. She's watching the defense. And uh, she sees that Dierica is late. She sees that the help has their back turned. Uh, so she's able to just throw it where Cheyenne is supposed to. Uh, and that helps us out a lot because sometimes you get guards that uh, j are just looking at Cheyenne and they don't see, they don't really see defense and uh, it, it ends up getting you in, in, in trouble where you're, where you're making turnovers. But we know that Cheyenne's going to make that catch. And once she has a player on her back, it's two points. And it's not even like she's going up against scrubs. I mean, that's Jerrica Hamby and Asia Wilson. Like she's going up against really good players too. Like she needs more respect in this league. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I, she's good. Like you've seen the last two games, I think she's at like 22 and, and 11 or 22 and 12. And uh, no, she's she's been good. Uh, that pass Sloot, was nasty. Yeah, Sloot, Sloot has been doing some great things. I think she's she's almost at like 10 assists a game this year. And um, she's, she's just been doing these things, uh, like getting her teammates, making her teammates better. And it's it's been amazing. It's been amazing. Coach, Coach do you think that she gets the attention that she deserves? Uh, I think she's starting to. But it's still not uh, to the point where I think she should. I mean, she's she's done things that nobody in the WNBA has done. Um, uh, the passes that she makes, uh, the reads that she makes, the fact that uh, this team uh, two years ago, two years ago, was with this with even less of a roster because there's no diamond, there's no there's no a Z. Uh, this team was a 12, 13 win team. And uh, she's been able to, you know, just take us to another level. And now we go into a lot of these games as the favorite, and our roster hasn't really changed. Uh, so I, I think, um, you know, it's it's not 
the I, I don't think she's getting what she truly deserves, but I think people are are noticing uh, what she's doing, and uh, now teams are even preparing for more. And she's still she's doing even better things as far as being efficient, uh, take care of the ball. Um, someone to have those many numbers and have over a three to one assist ratio is is uh, is crazy. Amazing. Take take us through this action here. I'm curious, just kind of uh, your 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 thoughts on this. It's a lot going on really quickly too. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, it's like a that's like a pistol action where. Um, Quigley sets the screen, and so a lot of a lot of times with guard to guard stuff, uh, you get confused uh, because they don't know whether to switch, whether to go, and the fact that Quigley's such a good shooter and she gets out of those screens really well, uh, it kind of leaves people confused. Now, when Snoop takes the baseline, she's such a great passer, and she, and she's such a um, such a triple threat as far as shooting, passing, and uh, handling the ball. Like you have to commit two players to her. And so if you commit two players to her, you know you're going to have to have a player with, uh, with Quigley. So that's, that's leaving uh, Ruthie on the roll wide open. And I've watched that clip like 10 times, and I still fall for the little head fake. That little head fake pass to Quigley in the back, and then, oh, man, that's nasty. Yeah, no, she's really good with it. Final one here with Slew, just a little dribble handoff. You guys run a lot of dribble handoff action with kind of your bigs. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, is that something that you also find to be obviously overly effective at times, depending on yeah. matchups? Yeah, I think with with coaches, uh, so you can stop it right there. With coaches, we always like, so when you're doing stuff, you say, hey, how do we uh, prepare for, what do we do in screening rows? Whether they're screening rows on the side, whether they're screening rows in the middle. Uh, I do think coaches talk about what do you do in handoffs, but it's the hardest thing to prepare for. Uh, because pick and rolls are so clear. A handoff isn't, it's a pick and roll, but it's not because the ball doesn't start up with a live dribble from the, from the guard. And so the post player, the post player actually is in a defensive stance. And so they have to stay in front of the, they, they have to stay in front of their player because their player has the ball. And so when, when they hand it off, it's hard for the post player to actually jump to the other side of the screen. It's actually harder than in a pick and roll because the post player doesn't have the ball in the pick and roll. And so that's why we like it uh, because it actually gets us going downhill. And uh, especially when you have the speed at the guards that we do, uh, when that post player has to make a decision uh, and the guard is, is behind the play, uh, I think we have some of the better guards in the league at making reads at, at that point. And another perfect segue, another player who has just been phenomenal. Clea Copper, my God. I mean, we, we could just do a show on Copper, in my opinion, and just kind of her evolution in, in, in it. I mean, just talk about Copper and just kind of what she means to this team and her ability to get it to the rim. I mean, no one could stop her. No, I, I think a lot of I think a lot of people were really surprised, and I, I received a lot of, you know, we received a lot of flack, like, why was Copper the priority that she was? But now people are seeing it. Um, she's talented, and we knew that she was talented. Um, and but you know it's it's tough to kind of put that talent on display when you're playing uh with two all WNBA uh, players at your position uh but we felt like she could be an all WNBA player too and it was just about her having an opportunity and so when we approached free agency uh we 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 let her know how much she was appreciated and you know she knows that this is home for her uh, and we 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 told her that she was going to have her opportunity to show herself, and uh, and we were just confident. We talked all the way overseas. I watched all her games overseas, and uh, this is no surprise for me. This is no surprise for her, and uh, she's going to keep on growing because she's a young player. Um, so we we just we're just happy. Like uh, we were happy when when she signed. Uh, I came all the way from like I came all the way from from Russia to see her doing free agency, and uh, it was it was a good meeting and. We were just happy to keep this thing going. Had nothing to do with getting out of the cold. Nothing at all. No, I mean, it was cold here in Chicago. I mean, it was oh, okay. I was, I was going from cold to cold, so it was it was really about copper. <laughs> what, what is it? What is it? Real quick before we transition to to Allie Quigley, that makes copper so effective. I mean, her length and her athleticism. But but what are some of the things that she possesses in terms of reads that make her so good? Uh, she has really quick speed. It's hard to stay in front of her. And the fact that she can shoot it too, uh, you know, and she, she, she's a player that doesn't stop moving. 
Uh, and that's what we like in our offense, a player that likes to back cut, uh, likes to rip and go off flare screens, like to come, likes to come off pin downs. Um, and the fact that, the fact that we have second side action and um, it allows people to actually close out to her. Um, it's a lot of guards in our league uh, that dribble, 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 dribble and attack. Uh, but the defense is loaded up, but that's what they like doing. Um, I, I like actually moving the ball to those players. Uh, moving the balls to those players so they can have a close out, a close out that they can attack. And uh, once you get a person closing out the car, she's just too hard to stay in front of. Mm -hmm. I want to know what her forty is. That's just me. Yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah, it's the it clip last year from 2019, and we it was at our place and it was going toward our bench. And I I, I don't remember the game off bad, but her we got a steal and. Her and Diamond. Diamond was at the bottom of the screen and Kyle was at the top of the screen. And it was like one of the most beautiful things I've seen. <laughs> like they were both running so fast and we got a layup, but it was like nobody around them. And they, it was like a race. It was like a foot race. And it was like, I, I was like, I pinched myself because to have two players with that speed, it's, it's amazing. The crazy thing for me is with Diamond, it looks like she takes one step and she's like yeah. already at the next hoop. Sure. With Copper, it's like you can tell how fast she is because she's putting in that work. But like, they're both just mind-blowingly fast. It's scary. No, it, it's it's uh it's and so I, I think next year when we have them both at full full strength, this it's going to be really really uh crazy as far as how, how what we're doing in fast breaks and stuff like that. And, and then you have Daddy with that that's not slow, so <laughs> we'll we'll be okay. <laughs> I have never moved that fast in my entire life, so I just have to watch it in awe, to be honest. So <laughs> moving on to Allie Quigley, and then we're going to finish up with some end of game situation, one that I'm most excited about. Um, I, I really, we had Allie on the show uh, a few weeks ago, which make sure you check that out, shameless plug. Uh, but Quigley, such a, such a special player, um, such a talent in this league. Her story in itself is incredible. You know, for you, and, and we talk about her quick release, right? We talk about the open threes, the penetrating kicks, but she is scouted for night in and night out. You know, opponents know when the ball is, you know, going to be in her hands. How difficult is it for you as the coach to get her shots? I mean, it's, it's, um, it's a challenge, but it's a challenge that we both like. The, the difference between her and uh, some of the other players that we have is um, – she likes, she likes moving nonstop. And it's not like, it's a change of pace to, from slow to, uh, to a little faster. You know, it's not with the crazy speed, but the fact that she doesn't stop and she changes her pace, it makes it easier for, for us to run sets for her, especially when everybody is moving around her and she reads things so well. So uh, I think one of the questions is sometimes we, we want her to shoot even when she thinks she's not open. And um, like like a play like that, for example, uh, just to slip because Sloot is so good. Uh, Sloot, Sloot is the type of person that if, if they don't switch or if they both go with Ali, Sloot is going to get a layup and she's going to read it. Uh, so Sloot attracts so much attention that they miscommunicate the switch for one second. Quigley is going to she's she's going to she's going to pop and, and, and get a wide open shot. So this is just literally a half of a second of a miscommunication, and now we've got an open shot. And she was telling us how you like her, what is it, like 60% from the left side three versus the right side three. She was breaking down the, the statistics for us and how you draw a place to go on that side. Sorry to give away some of the secret sauce there. She did that. Yeah, she has her high, she has her high zones on the floor. Uh, so a lot of stuff that we run, uh, we run for her. Uh, we we know specifically where she's going to get shots, and we and we want her to get her shots from those places. So uh, that that's really important for us. Um, that attention to detail, and it, it is with most of the players, but especially with the players that are really efficient from a certain area. Um, we try to get them shots at their at their places, and if we see something trending like from the corners uh, or something like that, we'll run plays for actions to get them plays there. Um, so that's what it's about, and that's where you see the execution. Uh, probably come into play is that that's where they're comfortable at. And uh, we just try to maximize that. And, and this right here, I know it looks real simple, salute with a penetrating kick. But for young players out there, you know, young guards, young shooters, for example, 
what Allie does in terms of drifting, to, I, we used to call it drift into the vision, drift into the baseline, whatever it may be, but just kind of talk us through this simple action, which as a viewer, you may not pick up what is going on here, but Allie's reading what Slute is doing and basically drifting to that open shot. So every time, stop right here, every time you have uh, a, a guard or, or a penetration toward the baseline, because they collapse the defense and the person in the back, I think that's DT, uh, they have to see the ball. They have to see the ball, especially when the person is getting beat baseline. And so as soon as they have to pay attention to the ball, that spot always has to drop, um, as, especially toward the ball. Then you have quickly that goes toward the corner. And that's where she's supposed to be. And that's why you see a lot of those hammer action plays, uh, because the player has to pay attention to the ball because they're the next rotation. Love it. Love so it. she's yeah. waiting for Diana to turn her head to give her the signal to hit that corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. I love this play. We had this with Allie. Um, you, you guys are always – this is such an unselfish team, and you guys are always looking for the extra pass. Dolson easily could have shot that. Shout out mm -hmm. Stephanie Dolson. We didn't cover some of her clips on this, but um, – you know, kind of that extra pass. She gives it up to Allie. Allie was like, I wasn't even necessarily open, but she can still create for herself. Uh, right. What is it about this team that just shares the ball so well? Uh, we, we, it, it was actually something we started last year, like drilling the stuff. We call it beautiful basketball. Yep. And so what we do is we set them up into, you know, five or sometimes four, and we'll run a set, and we'll run it at really high speed. And at the end of that set, it, we'll just turn it into action. Uh, where they're just moving the ball, moving the ball, moving the ball to get the best shot possible. And um, and they're so hype on the sidelines from the other team running it that it looks beautiful. And when the shot goes in, uh, the next team, they try to match it. And um, so you see a lot of, you know, you're going to see a lot of ball moving because we actually practice that stuff. Would you have been mad if Dolson took that shot? Uh, um, no, no. I, I mean, that's a funny. We had a – that's – we had a um, conversation today. I want her shooting more. Uh, uh, I actually wouldn't have been, I actually, it actually would have liked it if it would have just redoubled back to Dolson. Um, that would have been good too. You know, like that's something that we work on, especially since you saw, if you go back, you see Dierica uh, kind of lingering inside, you know, uh, she, she didn't come back out. So if it would have went back to Dolson, Dolson would have had a good shot. It would have been okay. Get one more look at it. So if it would have gone back. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's fine. I mean, I wouldn't have mind her shooting the shot uh, because she's good from that spot. So. All right, we've got three end-of-game situations, starting out with a sideline out of bounds. It looks like this is some sort of elevator screen, even though Copper goes around it. What, mm -hmm. what was the look here? Yeah, it was elevator screen, and uh, but she read it, which we always encourage her, her to do. And so Slute is gonna Slute is gonna flare off Gabby, and so Gabby is actually since she flare off Gabby, Gabby is actually gonna feel behind. And so Gabby is another read that's open if the baseline is 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 is, uh, is off. And uh, so after you see. Um, uh, after she takes it out, after Quigley takes it out, she just seeps in. And we know that she's going to get attention. But we were hoping that since the ball goes the other way, it would actually uh, open up Jackie a little bit. Uh, but we, we knew that Steph's player was going to have to help. And so Steph is, is going to get a good, you know, she's going to get a good screen right here on Quigley. Well, Jackie that that's part of the reason we couldn't do any Steph, uh, any reviews on Steph, because I would get a body cast just watching those picks that she sent. It's an, oh my God, my neck hurts watching that one. I feel so bad for Jackie Young on that one. And it wasn't really Jackie Young's fault because nobody told her the screen was coming and she recovered really well too. So, I mean, it was just, it was a uh, good defense, but better offense, I think. Coach, one of the, the, the play calls, whatever this was of the Best year. play of the season. <laughs> it has to be in the top five. Um, what, what were you thinking um, headed into this timeout and with this play call, and how did you get this shot? It was, it was a play. Like, so we knew, we, we knew, unfortunately, we knew that uh, uh, their games are going to come down to the end. So we put that play in. We just put the play in. And what we wanted to use is Allie as a decoy. Uh, we wanted to use Allie as a decoy because we knew that uh, – they were gonna like follow Allie out, and we wanted to misdirect. We wanted to misdirect because uh, we, with them following Allie, that means Slew was gonna be open on the weak side. 
and we want to make sure that we put Wilson in the screen. And so we want and we want to put Wilson in the screen and commit two to the ball. So we were going to have something wide open. Uh, and we knew that her coming off a step up, they were going to commit two to the ball, and she just ended up even more wide open than we thought. Um, we, 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 we knew that um, they were going to stay close to Quigley. Um, and so that's why she was, so, she was the farthest away from the ball, too. So. Shout out to Steph Dolson again with the killer screen on Avery Wilson. Man. Oh, it looks like she got hit by a truck. I'm curious. This is more of like an a all-encompassing question for you as a coach. Do you keep a few plays in your back pocket like, okay, if it comes down to it, we're going to do this, I've read the scout? Or are you more of a, a coach who's, you know, during the game like, oh, I can see that this would work at an end game situation? Like, I'm so curious kind of to pick your brain because you're calling these great last minute calls. How do you decide? So um, at the end of the game, I have, I have a, 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 I guess, a Rolodex of plays in my head, and I have like four that I give to uh, our coach. And a, a lot of them is going to depend on how they play us and what I see from them in the previous games or how they played us in the previous games. Mm -hmm. Most of my play calls that I call in the game um, after timeouts, we've never seen them before. Uh, and that's something that I just, okay, they're playing us this way. We need a quick two. This is how we're going to do it. Um, and if I see that it's good, I'll keep it. Um, and, and sometimes uh, I'll make them up on the spot because of the way that they're playing us. And it'll be something out of a play that we have in our playbook, but it'll be totally different. Um, I don't know. It's, it's something that, um, I, I wish I could explain it. Um, it's something that, um, it's just, um, um, intuition. Yeah. I mean, I, mean I, I, I used to do it in San Antonio and Dan was really stickler about, it. I have to see it. I have to see it. Show it to him. I couldn't, it's like a math quiz. I couldn't show it to him because it was here. So, um, no, it's, it's something I like, I really like doing. And, uh, when I'm watching, uh, defense of another team, even during the game, I'm making mental pictures and, uh, I have a, a great coaching staff that reminds me of stuff of that we've seen. And, um, Sometimes it, it, it sometimes it's good, but you know, a lot of times it's not either. Um, I think I had a game at the end, and I should have kept it simple, and, and Sloop got a turnover, and um, I, I kicked myself uh, right when I did it because it was something that I, I could have just kept really, really simple, and um, I, I just I overthought it, and uh, it put us in a bad situation. Uh, but it's just something that's in me that I really like doing, and that I see on the floor and um I wish I could explain it better. Man. Well no, I mean we, we appreciate all your all your insight for sure. This this is our last one and then we'll we'll jump into some rapid fire for you. This was end of game. Looks like there's just under 14 seconds on the clock tie game with Washington. Mm -hmm. A lot of a lot of different ways you could play this scenario, but what, what were you thinking with this one? Uh, so this is Cheyenne broke this play uh because she didn't see it uh she didn't see it coming quick enough on the one side. Uh, because what we were going to do is we were going to, we were going to screen uh, Allie. Allie was going to be open coming off this four, three, uh, but she read the weak side. And so what diamond uh, was going to do was stop right here, stop right here. So what diamond, diamond was actually in a good place where she, she could walk you up and then back door. Cause if she would have walked her way up uh, it's, we got an action. We got a name for this action where she brings it up and then she, she goes back door. Uh, but, uh, Ariel Powers played her flat and uh, Diamond still was able to get a lane. But the, the action was for Allie to come off this thing. If you could see, she's stuck in, his, in Z's um, screen. And if, if she would have been a little bit more patient, then she could have just pitched it back to Allie, who would have been open. Okay. That's what the play was for. It's a little bit broken play, but hey, you made something happen. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's option, so we, I mean, it's good. Um, but uh, yeah, that was that's that's what the play was. That's what the primary option was. So she she didn't she didn't think it was enough time. So she, you know, this is this is a part of her maturation. You know, she's she's turned into a playmaker as well. So uh, we we trust her in those type of situations. Yeah, a bunch of playmakers. Now I'm gonna put you on the hot seat with some rapid fire questions. Answer whatever comes to your mind first. What part of your coaching? And I I already know my personal answer, but uh, what part of your coaching goes unnoticed by media? <laughs> you can call us out. I, I'll give you a hint. I think it's your end, your end of the game plus stuff. So like, I don't, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Like, honestly, um, 
that I don't I don't really pay attention to it. I, I'm I'm really every day. I'm I'm reading books. I'm watching video. I'm trying to be a better coach because I've I've only been head coaching for a year and you know some change. And so uh, I just try to be better than the, than the previous day. So I, I don't know if anything goes unnoticed tonight. <laughs> okay, I've got one. Let me answer. Let me answer. The fact that he he can be wrong. Did you hear him in that last segment, you know, where he talked about, oh, I, I messed this up and maybe I overthought it. A lot of head coaches, in my opinion, um, can are, are always right. You know, so just the fact that you are, are like, that's on me. I really respect that. Just my two cents. I appreciate it because yeah. you, wouldn't, you wouldn't know how many times I think I'm wrong in a day. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm, I'm like really hypocritical of myself. And um, like uh, my, my, I'm always talking, my assistant coach is always talking me off a ledge because um, every, every, every loss or every misplay, I'm kind of um, like putting it on myself. Like to, so I, I, I feel like, I don't know, that's probably something I have to get better at, but uh, my wife and my assistant coaches, they know that I'm really like critical of myself. And so when we don't get things done, like a play doesn't work or, um, I try to put my, I try to put as much pressure on myself to get it right. Cause at the end of the game, I want to be good. And I, I've always told the players, I was like, if you give me 37 minutes, 37 minutes, the last three are on me. So uh, I like that. I might, I might make a little uh, plaque of that. <laughs> Tell me who is your favorite musician? Ooh. Oh man. Uh, I'm curious the answer for this one. Wow, my favorite. We're not, we're not killing the rapid fire, by the way. I know. I don't know why I call it rapid fire. Do I supposed to go fast with that? Like, no, I, no. I mean, I say rapid fire, but take all the time you need, coach. <laughs> favorite musician. Um, any any European musicians? We. Should I was know? expecting like an out there guy. One that I really love. I, I really love. It's a Belgian singer. His name is Stromae. How do I spell that? I'm gonna write this down. S T R O M A E, uh, and he's uh, he's so talented, like he's so talented, and he's he like got me into like um, uh, he he got me into like his music a few years ago, and um, it, it's he, he's he's the most talented uh, singer, and the things that he sings about, the way that he plays with his words, and um, he's just he's just really he's 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 incredible. All right, moving on to that next question, and now I have a new playlist for uh, for my next run. What are you going to be focusing on? Hopefully, it doesn't come for a long time. But as a coach, what are you going to be focusing on growing your coaching repertoire this off season? Um, uh, I guess like the things that I, I I know that I need to like I'm I'm reading this book about uh, about having a championship mentality, and um, a lot of it is like setting aside emotion and being able to stay in the moment. Um, I think a lot of times we get so wrapped up in in the game and players and refs and and so me and be able to just stay like sturdy and um I think it, it was a big challenge for me at last offseason the way we lost and just having all those emotions inside of me because of the way we lost last year and uh being able to channel that in a good way and just say okay I learned from our mistakes and we just move on and that way I can be a better leader for the players that struggle with confidence sometimes or struggle with missed shots or struggle with um, if they can see me tuning, honing in my emotions, they'll hone in there. So that's going to be the biggest thing that I try to change. I mean, try to, uh, I guess, develop or, or, you know, mature in, uh, in, in off season. Now this is a fun one. Top button or zipper. You're always to the top. Mm -hmm. And I, I need to know, mm -hmm. is this a new trend? Have you been doing this your whole life? What's the backstory between this? Let's coach in the league, hands down. No, I, I just I, it's it's always been a top button thing, even with no tie. Uh, I kind of got that from my dad and my brother. That's how we've always been. So it's a nerdy thing. And so I was in when I was in high school, I used to do the same thing. And so you would see people like they would like be on me, like, "Yeah, why you always do that?" And then they, I would see other people doing it, like, and I'm like, "I started that," you know. And so you I've. I've always been up to the. I've oh, this is not a new thing. This is something you've done for years. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I've always been to the T. Like you, you'll see me sometimes with open collars, but for the most part, when I'm like doing something, it's always like to the top. Shout out to Two K. They got to get that right. I saw they had you unbutton no tie. Hey, at least at least they got at least they got my face kind of right this time. There you go. <laughs> that was good. Yeah. It was good. 
moving on to another tough one for you. What? Who's the toughest team to scout for in the league? Um, toughest team to scout for. Um, I would probably say. Oh, it's, it's a lot. Um, I, I would say it's between um, uh, Washington because of their actions. Like their actions, they have so many uh, actions. And um, it, in Minnesota, too, it's tough because they they have so many, like, uh, people that can kill you in different spots. And so it's like, who do you focus on? Uh, in Minnesota like that's the issue like you focus on Collier um, Dantas is going to kill you focus on Dantas uh, Dangerfield is going to like it's so hard and like anybody Rachel Banham can have 20 points Carlton can have 20 points so it's like we don't want this person to get off but we don't want her to get off we don't want her to get off and it'll be a person that's averaging five points a game and they have 24 points on you so they're hard they're hard in that regard because it's no star player Um, I mean Collier she is a star player but I mean it's no um, solidified, like, right. like Sylvia Fowles is not playing now. Simone Augustus is not there. Maya Moore is not there. So uh, they're a tough team to scout. And I was assuming you would just say like, oh, I know that they're very, uh, whatchamacallit team, I'm blanking on the word. They always have their MD 2020 hidden in one locker room <laughs> in, in all those rituals or whatever. I thought you were just going to like come in there and be like, I know Cheryl likes to show up 45 minutes early and put a water bottle on the third seat. So I just come and knock the water bottle down. I, I would, man, but you know, <laughs> I, I'm kind of, you know, I'm, her, her, with her and, and Claire, I'm kind of scared that they'll jump me in my sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Coach, one final question: Do you have any words of wisdom for aspiring coaches? Uh, I guess um, it's about the work. Um, it's about the work, um, and it's about how. I don't know. I, I. I, I guess the best thing for me to say is you have to find pleasure in the process um, and just understand that everything else is going to come. Um, I've never coached a game to like win awards or win things. Like I really like staying up to three in the morning and watching video or talking to coaches and kind of picking their brains. I, I love doing those things. And I think that's the, that's the thing, the things that you don't see. Um, calling the games and being there and, and actually being on the sideline is, is a plus. I do love it, but the actual coaching part and learning uh, from every mistake that I've made, that's, that's like the biggest thing. And I think uh, as a coach, um, as a coach that wants to get to a certain point and say, Hey, I want to coach in the WNBA or I want to coach in the NBA. Um, you, you better be finding pleasure in the process of getting there because that's where everything is that's what makes you better for end of game situations. That's what make you better for uh, dealing with different personalities is what you learn along that journey. So uh, that's, 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 I guess that's my best advice. Thank you so much for joining us for the, for the Windsider film room. I know I'm smarter for this. You've probably gotten stupider talking to us, but Hey. Yeah. <laughs> I'm learning every day. <laughs> thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you. Hey, and good luck this week and good luck in playoffs. All right. Thank you guys. Always a pleasure.